Okay, just you ready to go on now? Sure. Okay. The first time I saw you guys was in 1995 on your club tour with Corn and. Um, and Lords of Brooklyn. That's right. Yes. Exactly. What city? Uh, Dobbs, Philly. Oh, oh, the tiniest club ever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, the, the oddest configured. There's yes. probably 150 people there, man. We've exactly. come a long way. Exactly. Both bands. <laughs> exactly. I know there was like se you know, sections of each of you those, know, like the Lords of Brooklyn people, yep. you guys in, in section, of course, the corn people. But so much has changed uh, sonically for you uh, since then. And um, I just, uh, you know, how do you account for the of your sound. Definitely, I'd have to give a lot of the credit to, you know, after playing for so many years, we got better at songwriting, but the most of the credit's got to go to David Kahn, our producer. We got him on our second record, Floored, and uh, I think that revolutionized our sound for us, don't you think, Craig? <clears throat> Plus, his involvement, DJ Homicide's involvement, got a lot more, you know, when upon Floored. Lemonade and Brownies, he was just involved a little bit. He, came, he joined the band sort of during the making of that record. So, uh, Second record, he got more involved, and now this record, 1459, he was even more involved. So I think that also helped. Right, right, because I mean the songwriting that was taken was really uh, it's gone to another level with this album yeah. as well. And uh, uh, how can you account? It, uh, I know with production is one thing, but the songwriting itself it just seems to have you know, just gone up another level. Yeah, um, it took our time. I can say that. <laughs> like you said, as a band, you just eventually evolved, and, and you start focusing in on your strong points. And we had a song like Fly was kind of a hit. You know, we kind of found our niche and, you know, we took the best things about Fly that we like, you know, lyrical patterns, places where the voice set good, and even um, the type of track that it was, and we just took it a lot further. And we just tried to make what we have good better. And um, it came out cool, and hopefully we can go even further with it. Right, and Fly, it's, it's interesting too, I mean, because I know, I remember uh, just the fact that uh, you know, Lemonade and Brownies didn't sell well, and all of a sudden Fly just uh, took me from obscurity to prosperity. Yes. And, and such, um, and um, also I understand Mark was less than thrilled uh, to do the song. He wasn't there when, when, we, when we wrote like the music and stuff for it and the chorus, I just want to fly apart. Um, he just, we were trying to write the record and we were kind of like, we didn't know what direction we wanted to go in and, and that was just a song that we came up with real matter of fact and we laid it as a demo for him, you know, on a tape, very informally recorded it. And yeah, he heard it and he was kind of turned off because it just was. Didn't have a vision. To yeah, see. He didn't have a vision. He didn't have a vision to see, you know, the possibility of that song. But when we heard it, we thought it was something special. We didn't know it was gonna be a hit, but we just thought it stuck out a little. So we didn't. We it was never worth even, pursuing. Yeah, we didn't. We never considered a single. We just thought, wow, it's pretty cool. It's something we never done before. Um, and we just took it from there. And then well, it, then he came around though. We, we went back to Los Angeles, and then he wrote verses for it. It, it evolved. The song yeah. just kept evolving. Then Super Cat got on it. David Kahn got a hold on it. And it just kept going and going and going. And then it turned into this masterpiece. And um, we still didn't believe in it, though. We was like, whatever, that's cool. We didn't, and then the label picked it as a single. And we were like, and it came out. And it just sh immediately, immediately went bananas. And um, it was a big deal for us because that was the first time any of us were actually played on K Rock, a radio station in Los Angeles, Alternative K Rock. Yeah, that was and, um, it was life changing. We right thought there. we made it then. We were like, we made it. We're on K Rock. We don't, you know, we didn't know anything about money or big shows. In fact, we or, still don't. You know what I mean? So it was just like <laughs> it was it was a big deal. It's one of the most special moments in our life. And, and again, it was very very different than anything you guys had done. Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, the band has dipped into stuff, kind of like working with drum loops and and guitars and stuff. Metal stuff, yeah. Yeah, and it was called. Ca they never were taken seriously as lyrically and you know with the harmonies as these songs are. And these songs we just like just put a lot of energy in them for yeah. once, and it was actually considered a song rather than a vibe track to fill up the album. If you look at our first album, we actually have like four, maybe even five very mellow songs, non-rock songs. So everybody thinks Fly was our first non-rock song. It wasn't. It was just our best, you know. And, and that's why it stood out, I think. And it opened up a bunch of doors for me because that's what I do. I make beats. I make you know beats by the day, all day, and for them to come in and it was just a cool little mix. Like, you know, you get like a hip hop vibe groove is what I had. And then like a foundation and a rider just come in and play guitar over it. And that's how we basically, just, even to this day, is how we originate tracks. And uh, Fly became, uh, obviously, you know, it, became, it, was, it was so massive, but when Fly dropped from the charts, mm -hmm. uh, a number of music critics uh, wrote you guys off as one hit wonders. And uh, what did yes, you say to the one hit wonder tag? You can't blame them. I mean, because we, to the most of the public, we did kind of come out of nowhere. So, you know, we just, Took it and uh, wrote the next record. What can you do, you know? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I really didn't hear it that much, as much as it's been played up to be, but mm -hmm. it was thrown around. And um, 
you know, there really wasn't another single after that. So what do you say, you know? And, you know, when we came out with Every Morning, then that just, it just diminished, you know? That's why, we named, that's why we named the record 1459, the yeah. one hit wonder, the 15 minutes of fame thing. We're just taking a, you know, stab back at the jokes, <laughs> you know? And that's where, the, you know, the Andy Warhol thing, 15 minutes of fame came into play, the whole nine, and, you know? And we're, we're sarcastic just, bastards, so that's yeah. where that comes out. So we just try to beat everybody to the punch. And now they're coming up with terms like three hit wonder. You know, we had someday, you know, every morning, you know, fly. So it's just like. <laughs> Do you feel vindicated by the uh, success the second time around? Though? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one of those things where you kind of, you go like, okay, I deserve to be here now. I'm actually a real team player. You know, you, you kind of consider yourself a real musician. You say, dang, maybe we do know how to write songs. You know, you just, I don't know, for me, it was just, it kind of solidified my career. You know, it was just like. Dang, we know how to really do this. This is really cool. We've People shared, really dig our music. We shared the same stage as some of the greatest, greatest musicians ever. Kiss, and, Rolling Stones. You know, all our like idols. You know, everybody yeah. that we grew up, all our influences. What's the strangest thing that uh, that's happened to you guys? The coolest thing being on, you know, like Kiss or Rolling Stones? Or um. It's just you're in awe because you're around the people that you grew up with. I think, Greg, well, we got to play three sto shows with the Rolling Stones. The last day, we got to do a little meet and greet and actually shake their hand. That was probably the, the looking into Keith Richard and Mick Jagger's eyes. Just I got to I'd be, real actually be strange. next to Keith Richards in the picture. We got yeah. photos. <laughs> and I'm just like. It was the strangest thing. It didn't uh, influence me too much. <laughs> the one thing, though, is that um, you, know, you guys are very animated entertaining on stage, uh, you know, which is uncommon these days. Uh, is it a natural thing, or have you guys been working very hard at the life? It's all—it's the only way we could do it. If we went up there and tried to be so serious, I don't think it would, you know, we we, it wouldn't at, be that interesting. We know? work hard at being animated, too, though. It's like, we, we that's part of the show, man. I mean, we don't want to go up there and just be like, you know, just, it's, it's, you see that in tons of bands, and, and, you know, we're not a serious band. Everybody knows that. You know, we get off just as much on the comedy aspect of our show as we do the music aspect of the Absolutely. show. And it's like, you know, like, like stuff like tonight when we do like a, uh, there's a thing where we do kind of like a hip hop skit. We bring people in a crowd and the whole thing is like the gong show. That's, that's what we got, grew up on. That's what we get off on. Yep. You know what I mean? Comes well, very natural to us. <laughs> you know, that's entertaining us. We want to entertain, you know? You're at the Chuck Barris. Exactly. Yes. Somewhere in the south of France right now. Happily residing. But before you guys broke, uh, uh, you, know, you went to see a fortune teller, Rodney? Uh, no, it was a, an old girlfriend, like, like 15 years ago, uh, went to a palm reader, and the palm reader told her, you know, a little stuff about me at the time. And Tell him about the black guy thing. <laughs> at the time, I was playing in, in a little, little kind of a, a, just a sort of a 60s pop band with Stan, our drummer, in this band. That band, I also played in a couple of reggae bands. And the fortune teller told her that I was going to make it real big, like it was going to be like an overnight success, and it was going to be four white guys and one black guy. And at the time, that's the configuration of the reggae band. So I thought that was it, but I thought that was strange to make it big in music and make it in reggae. And um, what else? Um, to save my money and just all these, you know, stuff about the band. And uh, I guess it kind of came true and it ended up, he ended up joining the band and it was weird. Very strange, sort of in the stars, I guess. Because he didn't tell me that until yeah, we, like we way blew after, up. Like yeah. he told me that after Fly and I was like, what? Cool. Were you guys, were you guys bumming this Woodstock? Yeah. I was terribly bummed. I mean, who wouldn't be? You know, even though it's kind of a disaster at the end or whatever, we were scheduled to play the first day. It would have been awesome. We were going to play right after James Brown, and Mark completely lost his voice. A lot of times we get hoarse from playing a lot, but he couldn't, he, he couldn't even speak. It was so bad. So we, there was no way we could have done it. They told him if they said you can, we can shoot you up with some stuff, you can do the show, and then you won't have a voice for two weeks at all. Or you when can stay here tour, and rest, yeah. Miss Woodstock, and then you can finish the tour. We were on tour with the Goo Goo Dolls at the time. And we just waited out, and we're like, you know, we can't miss two weeks of shows, man. I guess, you know, we just have to take this one in the butt and deal with it. <laughs> Ow! Did you guys detail the songwriting process? Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's really, 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 like... Uh, there's a few different ways, and it comes from everybody in the band. Um, really sometimes Murphy will come with, with like a guitar riff because everybody can kind of play guitar, you know, in the band. So sometimes Murphy will bring in a riff and we'll all sit in a room and compose a song around that. Other times he'll be in the studio and he'll lay a drum beat down, he'll make a drum loop, and then I'll add some little licks and, and gadgets and stuff. It's real dysfunctional, man. We're never really all there together, and then, actually. Here's the clincher, though. Then Stan, our drummer, will come in and write a chorus like 
every morning or fly or something yeah. and just make the song awesome. So okay. everybody throws little bits in. Mark will write lyrics. Sometimes, you know, San and I will help him with lyrics. Murphy will pitch in there. Everybody, it's coming from all over. That's why I have so many styles. What is the biggest misconception about Sugar A? That Sugar A is Mark. Yeah. That, that's his name and stuff. Other than that, everybody, you know, we put it all out for everyone to see. What you see is what you get with us. Um, I think hopefully we'll just take our experiences and uh, our accomplishments right now and musically hopefully we can just write a new record man and, and go forward with what we've done now and just progress a little and, and just make an even better record and focus in on the best things that we've done on this record. All our experiences, our money, management, you know, everything and just take it. And just go forward. And learn from it. And yeah. learn from everything all the way around the board in the music industry. So more immediately, we're going to like finish this 1999 out touring on this record and um, hopefully get down to Australia. And we've got a lot of fans in Australia. It's actually, we get the most hits on our website from Australia besides yeah. the United States. So go down there, maybe cruise through Japan, and then uh, come back and probably end by February. And then um, take maybe two or three days off and then write the next record. It takes us a long time to write songs, so we've got to start early. Do you have an idea, a sonic direction for the next album? Absolutely not. We never know until we start no. writing. What, what I, maybe, I, maybe like, we have a song called Falls Apart, which we just shot a video for. That's going to be a good direction. Maybe kind of in that direction, because that's a good blend of his drum loops and our live playing. It's kind of like, that's sort of like our, our perfect song. On it's definitely, record. see, we, we have, you know, our music is just such a big smorgasbord. Maybe it would be a polka song. Smorgasbord, smorgasbord. I don't know. You know, it's just like whatever's hot, whatever sounds right, and whatever feels good to us and our producer. You know, we're just gonna roll it. We're not gonna, we're gonna open, not close any doors, you know what I mean? Especially sonically. Expect the unexpected from us. Exactly. Right. Well, Falls Apart is probably the, I think, the catchiest thing you guys have written. Wow. Wow. Thanks. Well, that's actually the new video. And that was the last song written for this record. That's why I think the next record might be in that vein, because we were starting to, we were kind of getting in on something toward the end there. Well, again, it's really interesting how, I mean, you guys have really written quite a few really polished pop songs. I, I don't know how. I guess because we all grew up listening to like, Pop music. My Sharona was an awesome song, you know. So we're kind of suckers for pop singles, but uh, then again, it always comes back to David Kahn. He's sort of the he puts the that master. pop sprinkle on it. He does. He has a little it's, box, and he it's dirty when we get a hold of it. He puts the pop sprinkles on it. He's a genius. He's the best producer of our time. Right. He's produced quite a few, you know, really great people. Absolutely. And and such. But uh, but it's, it, what you're mentioning too, it's interesting, like about going back the the '80s, which it seems to be coming back, has had such an effect on. It has, because that's, that's all we know. That's what we grew up on, you know? So, definitely. The 80s is very much in Sugar Ray. And, we uh, all grew up in the 80s. And David Conn was a big producer in the 80s. He did the Bangles, Romeo Void, and all, all that. All our influences come from yeah. the 80s. And so. <clears throat> so, maybe the next album will have, uh, you know, that 80s vein. Well, we've had, we have a song called Personal Space Invader on this record that's very um, 80s, 80s new wave ish. Yeah, and then on our last record, we did uh, Stand and Deliver, which is an Adam Ant song. So yeah, it's, it's definitely always there with us. We did Abracadabra, which is 1980, 82 or something, yeah, so. And, and such, um, and, um, and, and speaking of the 80s, I guess the late 80s, what was it like working with Karis One? Awesome. <laughs> he was cool, man. I mean, what was, a nice guy. He's really nice and he's a great talent. And I, I more so grew up on him than the rest of the guys in the band. I was just kind of, you know, because of the hip hop thing and I grew up listening to hip hop and because I'm, but, um, it was just all the way around the board. He was just a great guy. He came in with wine. He was real cordial. He was really nice. He's like he made the song like extra special too. Yeah, he's just having his. He's got this mammoth voice. Yeah, and he's it's just awesome. he's just he's a great presence, man. He's a great person. Besides him being a great talent. And, but uh, what I want to uh, mention, obviously, Mark's been bandied about uh, a few times, but it, it's just interesting too because uh, I think it's easy for people to write him off as just a pinup, but uh, obviously he's a you know a smart, funny guy who's immersed in pop culture. And yeah, there's a lot more to Mark than, than I think what people, what the general public think of him, you know? Right, I, I mean, it's uh, obviously, uh, that, that's the case. Uh, and, uh, I mean, he held his own with Bill Maher on Politically Incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> did very well in there and, uh, and, and such. But my favorite uh, Mark appearance, I think, was the um, on Rock and Roll Jeopardy. Uh, I mean, he, he, he did very well. And uh, I, I just uh, didn't know whether to, you know, run into him without congratulating or worrying about him since uh, seem to know too much about forgettable 80s songs. You know what? We, it falls back into that 80s we, thing. We weren't worried about him. He's been on actually twice, and he destroyed the other people both times, and we knew that was going to happen. He does that for fun, though. I would have bet, bet 
you know, a million dollars that that was going to happen. And it'll happen again if they have them on again because that is what we do backstage naturally. That's what we've always done Years. since high school. We all sit there and like quiz each other. And, and you think he's good at, at like 80s new wave stuff. Get him on 80s heavy metal like the hair bands. He'll know oh every God. guitar player. He's every even better. Bass. He'll know every bass player. Every, it's scary. I know when he answered who was bad English, who was Michael Damien? And, you know, he's got it all. Yep. Who is that? <laughs> so I have to ask Mark that, the answer that answer. He was, just, he was just too good with bad 80s pop. Yeah. But uh, one other note about that, uh, your label mate, Edwin McCain, uh, yes. oh. who uh, Mark crushed on Rock and Roll Jersey, yes. uh, he recently told me that Atlantic Records is feeding him answers since uh, your album is much more successful <laughs> than it is. Oh, that's funny. But you got to think of some excuse when you get beat so bad, you know? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, definitely, it was, it was definitely. Edwin's a great guy, too, by the way. That's funny. That guy's funny as hell. Yeah, he is, he, is a, you know, he has the best sense of humor. The guy had us laughing. We just played a festival with him recently. And uh, very entertaining guy. And how is the tour going? Which tour? I mean, we're, we've just finished a tour. <laughs> we? Yeah, we just <laughs> actually finished a tour with the Goo Goo Dolls. I mean, you guys are out with the Goo Goo Dolls. We did that for about two and a half months. And then um, we took a week off. And then now we're doing some radio shows. And then we're going to do uh, a couple other dates. So um, it's going to spread us out. It's about 14 shows between now and uh, November, and then we're gonna just take some time off and just. We know. got some awesome things. We're gonna be on the the Radio Music Awards show. We're gonna be uh, playing on the show, and it's that's in Las Vegas. Um, we got a show in Hawaii, so we're gonna go out there like about a week early and really do it right. Can't wait to do that, and uh, that'll take us up to uh, Christmas, and probably do more radio shows for Christmas. And, and has the burn factor set in yet? Because you guys have been doing this, I guess, what since. I'm we started, December, we started in December. Our record came out January 12th. So we've been touring. There hasn't been a month in 1999 where we haven't been on tour, basically. So yeah, you could say we've toured the whole year. And the burn factor set in a good couple months ago, yeah. <laughs> but what are you going to do? you got to keep going. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, it's, just a, it's a job like everything else. You know, people get burnt to go to work every day on their job. It's a natural thing. But at the same time, you know, we have more fun than the average person. And our life is partying. So, you know, we get paid to drink beer. So... It's cool, man. I mean, you know, you get, everybody gets the little burn factor going on. But when it all comes down to it, sometimes, like, my, even myself, I go home and I get home for, like, a day or two, and I'm like... You get antsy? You just, like, do. I, I want to get back out there. So, you know... We're lucky to build. We're lucky to, to do it. Right we appreciate it. Well, you guys have been very successful. I mean, uh, you know, Ford has double platinum and 1459, you know, which is... Uh, you know, he just went double platinum, too. Also. Congratulations. Lucky. And, and that is exactly it, the fact is that you guys you know, can make records and, and continue on and you know, some others aren't as lucky. Yeah. yeah. That could have been us. You know, after, like you said, our first album didn't sell a lot. We were just, uh, we were real lucky. I, we, I, don't know, I don't know really why we were able to make a second record because most bands, it's terrible the way the music business is set up. If you don't totally prove yourself on the first record, you're out, you know. And a band like us, like, it takes a couple records before you really find your niche. So it's, it's kind of stifling, you know, to a lot of new artists coming up. Oh, there's no doubt. And the other factor is that uh, you're diverse. And usually in the music business, that's not such a good thing. That's a, yeah, it's hard for, for the label to sort of market us and, and promote us because you don't know which genre to go to. But I guess, uh, I don't know, we got lucky. <laughs> uh, no, no doubt and, and such. And, uh, and, and, and I guess you're going to be touring them through next year then. Yeah. But what, what, what's, what makes it, you know, fresh? What, 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 uh... what makes touring fresh? Yeah. Just the shows, you know? What's the people? The people. Little, you know, we'll have little kids come up and say this is their first concert ever. And I flash back to my first concert ever was Kiss. So that's a big moment, and I'll never forget that. So either will they, you know? So that is really cool. That, that kind of fuels us on when we get to talk to fans at shows and stuff. You guys, that's another thing too about you guys, which is uh, unlike I think a few other acts. You guys, uh, there is that accessibility factor. Where, you know, we try to be. It, it gets a little more difficult as as you get, you know, a little more more recognized or whatever. But we definitely try to keep that that going. Mark Camp isn't quite as accessible because it's people don't understand how how hectic it is for him. I mean, it's crazy. Man. You can't go anywhere without people just all over him. He's way more approachable, I guess, to people than uh. And another, you know, any other like an like actor celebrities or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, he just, you know, people feel people react crazy just, to, to scream across the street and run at him and like, yeah. Know. And guy, every guy wants to walk. Hey, hey, Sugar Ray, what's going on, bro? You know, so like it's it's wild, you know, because I go out with him all the time. But um, you know, what do you do? I mean, 
you know. No people, one's complaining. Yeah, and, nobody. Yeah. He's not complaining. You know. You and he tries. He tries to be cool to, to people. You know, when he meets them. Right, but does it bug you guys when on a certain occasion where they think Mark is, hey, that's Sugar Ray? Yeah, that's what you asked. Yeah, what's the biggest misconception? I mean, it bugs us, but we're, we're not surprised. You know what I mean? I mean, plus, that's obviously not like a, a total Sugar Ray fan or they would know. Yeah, that's not that's somebody who really knows it. about anything about the band. If you, say, if you think he's Sugar Ray, when he's gone on TV, he's done, you know, interviews a number of times of him telling people that he's not Sugar Ray. And the, the problem is, when you have a band name that, that can be taken as somebody, as a person's name, Tell me Ian Anderson didn't get called, hey, Jethro, from Jethro Tull, every day of his life. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's to be expected. Ryan, how many other guys are on the cover of uh, Cosmopolitan? Yeah. <laughs> and, and such a bit. That's the thing, too. I mean, you guys have been, the exposure levels. So it's really strange, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but good. I mean, the fact, yeah. I mean, not only with Mark, but also you guys, I mean, the, the fact that you're out there, I mean, it seems like, you know, between the magazine uh, and, and television shows, you know, Sugar Ray, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. Angelica, our publicist, keeps us very busy. There's more to come, too. Yes. And when did you say you will be recording in February? When no, no, well, we're going to stop. We don't have exact date. Start, I mean, start writing. And we'll stop doing live shows in February of 2000, and then over the next few months, start to write the record. That's, that's our goal. We want to have a record out in 2000 also, by the end of 2000. Wow. So that's not easy to do, so we'll see if we can do it. No, especially in the recording industry where there's yeah. delays. Even if you have exactly. to have it in the can. You have to have, the, yeah, you have to have it in the can and then like a couple months have to go by so they can start the promotion and it's a big thing. But it's really up to us. If we write it quick, you know, then we can have it out. Well, that means you'll be having, uh, it's interesting too because you're talking about the bands that you grew up with and such and during like the 70s and 80s. It Look. Wasn't that, it wasn't uncommon to have... Uh, two records in a year. How about that? You know, the Beatles were putting out two, sometimes three records in a year, so... I mean, if they can do it, we can do it. Of course, recording's a lot <laughs> different now, you know, but, no. We'll see. <laughs> right, exactly. And in terms of that, too, um, the, uh, does it get you down about, like, working with research or whatever that has to get into it, the marketing end of it all, or is that? No, because it's a business. I mean, no matter how you want to fight it, the music industry is definitely a business, and you got to do that. you got to go through all the steps and all that. So, and hopefully, you know, if you have a good relationship with your record label, which I think we do, just good communication, you can get you can get what you want out of it, you know? One thing I was wondering, too, is about the, the fans that, um, you know, were attracted to Sugar Ray, the more aggressive songs from... Oh, yeah. Uh, how, I mean, did you have a fear of alienating them? Yeah. N you know, you, you think about it, but you gotta, you gotta first please yourself before you please anyone else, and it wouldn't have been real to us if, if we didn't try to, like, keep changing and stuff like that. And I think that the real Sugar Ray fans, look at Lemonade and Brownies. There's, there's like, a slow wannabe R&B song on there, and there's a total... Kid Rockish type metal rap songs on there. Right. So it's all, from day one, it's been that way, you know. Plus, if you if, if you're a fan who likes the harder stuff in Sugar Ray, the majority of our show is all the you know the harder Still things. Harder so life, you yeah. don't really get denied you know the old Sugar Ray tracks. Cause a lot of the set is the first album. Yep. So um, especially live, we don't you know we are, we got to throw that out there. We like our shows to have more energy. energy and, yeah. and so it's like the, the, the those tracks are you know the energy of our show. And what about the other side where there's the casual fans who Fly We're just like, every morning and it's, uh, hey, we got the first time when we came out with Fly, we went over to Europe and our first show there was in Denmark. And when we started to play Fly, we got, they were like, ooh, it was, it crushed us. We didn't play Fly the rest of the tour in Europe. We were so crushed. It's a, little, it's a little startling, but now we've sort of like got a really perfect balance of the two. So even when we're playing the, the sort of mellower songs, if you look at the audience reaction, everybody's still freaking out. So I think, uh, you know, we, we, we touch on a little of everything, so if you come to our show, you're, you're definitely going to hear something that you like off, off one of the three of our records. Right, and again, it goes back to diversity, where you guys have something, I yeah. say something for everyone. It sounds like a marketing. But that's the way we are. Like, he likes a lot of different stuff that I like, and he doesn't know a lot of stuff that I, you know what I mean? So if we're all writing, then it's going to be that way. That's the way the music is for us. It's the way you... Well, that must be the cool part about Sugar Ray, the fact that it seems like you have five guys who each have their different that's the twist. Very much. Yes. That's the twist because you have five totally different influences, and when you make a track, you get the best out of those influences, and um, it no just comes no together. One's anything either, yeah, you know? No one's denied anything either. We all everything. He could write the whole song. We wouldn't deny him of that. But we take everybody's best, you know, attributes and just dump them in there. You know, whatever. And everybody's starting to learn their strengths. So now we know what to expect from each other on a, on a track. You know what I'm saying? And it, but you still never know who's gonna come up with what. You never know, and it's just like, that's the beauty of it. Well, you guys are a true collective. They, yeah. 
Okay. We also have an interesting uh, scenario with, with Stan writing the choruses and much yeah. and, and coming up with the hooks. It was just one of those. It was one of those weird things. Like, I don't even think Stan's been writing songs his whole life. Yeah, I mean, since we were yeah. since we were fourteen and fifteen in a band together, um, he was writing songs. I think, I think with the song "Fly," it gave us a lot more confidence to sort of go to dig a little deeper lyrically. And God bless Stan. What happened, what <laughs> happened was say. what happened was is I basically took his job from him on playing a few drums, playing yeah. drums. So he came out and got on the mic. And um, he's, usually, he's usually one of the guys in the band that you know, comes up with a lot of the melodies and stuff. And you know, the last future, like every morning, um, the part glory, of part of someday, uh, fly. I mean, he just, the stuff was done for him. He didn't have to play drums on it. He didn't have to worry about his thing. And he would come in and just, he would just get on the mic. And it, we kind of make that his responsibility now. So we, you know, it's like, hey, Stan, you got to come in. Like, we have a new track that me and him, once again, started, foundation started with me and him. And, you know, now I'm gonna make CDs of it and dump it off to everybody, and I'm just, that's gonna be one of the guys to get it. And it's just like we're gonna, it's gonna be a good we're, gonna, we're gonna start from there. So, you know, and it has a filter through all of us. If it doesn't have all our touch on it, it's not a Sugar Ray song. And never, never has one of the songs that all five of us haven't touched been one of our great songs, pretty much, so to speak. But also, really set up too that now that you've taken the last two albums, Stan's job essentially. It's interesting. Stan has a new job. <laughs> At least he's not collecting unemployment. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting uh, with the drummer coming out and strapping on a guitar. It's just a different take. He straps on a lot of stuff. <laughs> I won't touch that one. But yeah. It's interesting set up there where you're hand, you know, percussion's handled and yep. he's out there. Uh, how much does he enjoy playing? Uh, I he, think he digs it. He yeah, I mean, like anybody it. can go front stage and stuff. I have one time in the show when I get to come out. It's the biggest deal for me. It's uh, great to be in front of the crowd and. Um, you know, he, he sings, he has major parts. He's a, he's a, but Stan and I have been singing and doing harmonies and stuff with Mark since our first album. So singing, singing is not new to Stan, but like coming out live and singing up front is definitely new to him. And he handles it great. Yeah. He's, been, he's been playing guitar for years, you know, but casually. So I mean, he's very competent on guitar. It's not like he just learned it or anything. The interesting thing about the band is that it's obviously based on friendship. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Uh, Four of you guys have been uh, friends uh, since, uh, since high school. Since high school. And then he, we picked him up, and he's been with us for like five years, and you know, it's like as if he's been there since high school too. Sorry, guy. And no, it's too with the situation too with 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 Craig. I mean, I mean, you know, did you know it's gonna be a full-time deal where you're doing that? No, um, they. Uh, what happened was somebody asked me to, to take the job and actually go on tour with the band. You can say his name. My, man, my buddy Paul Pontius, man. He's a guy who worked at Immortal Records. Uh, actually signed Korn. And um, he's one of my friends. And he just he told me, he said, man, it's a chance for you to work with this band. Just go on tour, you know, and just, you know, get in the music industry. Besides the fact what I was doing. And he was just like, try it out. Tried it out. Boom, I went on tour. Boom, first album. Wrote the second album, Fly, Bloom, Every Morning, Bloom, and that's where I am. Paul, the guy who introduced us, told us, he goes, I got a DJ and he's a total clown just like you guys. That's quote, you know, word for word what he said. And it came out to be very true, very accurate. <laughs> Rodney, when did you know that this is the element, this element is missing, we, we dig this, this is what we um, Probably around 91, we, we recorded a song. It was before we had a record deal. We recorded a song and and House of Pain had done a track with, for the song, uh, for the movie Judgment Night. And House of Pain and Helmet did a song together. And that like, we'd already been a band, but that was like, wow, you can take it sonically so much better with the DJ. So ever since then, really, that was like the first thing. And ironically, the guy who produced our, co-produced our first record is DJ Lethal from House of Pain. So he was actually very instrumental in, in getting our formula down. You know? Yeah, there's a lot of things DJs can, DJs can do as far as like, the creation of a song, the structure of a song, and sonically, son making it sonically there's no limit when you're a DJ. I mean, anything can go on. Any record there is, it exists. If it's a sound record, whatever it can be, you know, you have to have the open mind. Like RPM, there's a song where I had this guitar sound. He emulated it on a guitar, and it became a race car battle yeah. guitar type of thing. It's unlimited. So, I mean, it's like, that's the twist, too. I mean, you can, when you add that into with a rock band, it's like, you don't know what you're going to come up with. So we always knew we needed a DJ probably since 91 or so. Okay. Right. Right.